Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to call to order this regularly scheduled meeting for the City Council of the City of Calistoga. It is Tuesday, February 18th at 6.02 p.m. City Clerk, has this meeting been properly noticed? Yes, it has. Can we have a roll call, please? Council Member Williams. Present. Council Member Lopez Ortega. Here. Council Member Krause. Here. Vice Mayor Dunsford. Here. Mayor Canning. Here. All members are present. We have a quorum. Thank you very much. If you've not already done so, please silence, either mute or turn off your cell phones. And then if you are able, please stand and join us for a salute to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening and welcome everyone. Uh, we did have a closed session uh, before and after our last regularly scheduled meeting. Uh, two matters, one was the uh, basically discussion on terms and conditions on the fairgrounds, potential fairgrounds acquisition by the city from the county and the other was a uh, personnel matter regarding evaluation regarding the city manager. On both points there is no reportable action at this time. We will now move on to oral communication. This time is set aside <clears throat> to receive comments from the public regarding matters on the consent calendar or matters of municipal concern that are not on the agenda. Pursuant to Government Code Section 54954.3, also known as the Brown Act, however, the Council cannot consider any issues or take action on any request during this comment period. Speakers are encouraged to limit their comments to a maximum of three minutes so that all speakers have an opportunity to address the council. I'll start with speaker cards first and then if there's anyone else who hasn't had the chance to fill one out, we'll go from there. First card I have is from Alex. Alex, should you so choose, but you are not required to do so, share with us your name and your address. I will. Alex Gellinger, 11 Terrace Drive. Um, I've already emailed the council on this a couple times, real annoyingly, I'm sure. We don't have mandatory garbage pickup in this town, and it is, I guess it may not be a problem to some people, but for some of us it is, if you live next to it, a Don Selvey years ago, or another guy who's getting a little old and doesn't quite see the urgency of it, and throw the other bag in the garage, and wait till you get a pickup truck full, and whatever. So anyway, uh, it's, it's something that I'd like to see us get. It's an eye roller. I move around the North Bay all day, and it's an eye roller when people hear that we don't have mandatory trash uh, pickup. Um, uh, it, it can be a rodent problem. As I said, that's what really spurred it on to me. We have cats, yet we still see rodents around. We do have chickens in town. We're allowed to have chickens, which is great. And if you read up on that, it's a real diligence about um, maintaining your property, or you'll have rodents. So it kind of becomes twofold for us. Um, and I'm just asking, look, don't be an enabler for an old guy. I may be an old guy without a wife one day too, and ha, huh, throw it in the garage, I'll get it next week. <laughs> and, uh, and it's a reality. So I'm, I'm asking, I won't keep annoying the council with letters. And um, I did have one other interesting thought. My wife and I left California in 93, and we lived on a dirt road in the Appalachians, and I recall we had mandatory pickup garbage. So uh, we're very unique. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that for many years, living here 23 years, but I don't want to be unique there. Thank you for your time. Thank Alex, you. thank you. Uh, your letters are not annoying. We appreciate <laughs> feedback from anyone. Um, I do sit and represent the city on the Upper Valley Waste Management Authority. Um, where there are some communities in the county that have mandatory and some that don't what I can assure you what I can when I what I can assure you is that uh, there are pros and cons and I will happily bring back 
uh, for the community's consideration what would be uh, involved there. But I'm not opposed to it. Uh, we'll bring you the pros, cons, and we go from there. All right. If uh, memory <laughs> serves me correctly, I think when Karen Slusser served on that board that uh, we moved away from mandatory trash pickup at yeah, we one. Used to, we used to have it. It used to be mandatory, right? It used to be. Yeah. And then 2020 in a city. Okay. Or Understood. No, I'm, 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 I'm just. You've spoken. Thank you very much. I will be happy to share them with you. Thank you, Alex. Just, just as a little history for everybody, we did have it, and then uh, there were some reasons that were compelling for the council to, uh, when we adjusted the contract with uh, uh, Upper Valley, that uh, we dropped that requirement. So, I'm certainly willing to re-examine it. Okay, I will bring that back. I have, I believe, Brian, is this for later? Okay. Is there anyone else wishing to address the council on a non-agendized item or a consent calendar item? With that being said, I will close oral communication, entertain a motion for this evening's agenda as presented unless a modification is requested. So moved. Second. I have a motion by Vice Mayor Dunsford, a second by Councilmember Krause. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you very much. Moving on, Council requests and ideas for discussion. Council Member Lopez Ortega. Uh, yes, um, it's related to um, the gentleman that just spoke. Um, now that the weather is, uh, is more nice and, and um, you know, uh, warm, uh, people start cleaning their homes, including myself. And it's very easy for us just to dump things on the street and write a note saying it's for free. So I think, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's good to do that um, at a certain point, but I think it's, it's about time for us to enforce penalties uh, for these acts because the city needs to look nice and clean and not only for people out of town, not only for the tourists or for the visitors, but also for our own community, especially uh, for our children. We need to set a sample for, for them. So I will request um, the city manager um, to start looking um, in something that we can do to enforce um, penalties for people who do that. And also, I wonder if it uh, will be possible to get on the agenda for March 17, um, a presentation about vaping products uh, with the Family Center. Regina Pena is the program coordinator for this program uh, at the Family Center, and I met with her, and we discu discussed about this issue. Santilina is already um, working um, in this. And I think it's very uh, important that uh, us as a council, we discuss about, about this, uh, this problem, especially, again, for the safety of our kids. And I, that's it for tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councilman Williams. <coughs> I have two items, Mr. Mayor. Uh, one, I want to uh, thank Mr. Kern and uh, City Clerk um, Kendall for um, on the staff reports, uh, City Manager Kern and I have talked a, uh, a couple of times about the format for the staff reports, and we see them all the time, and, and we get used to them. Um, but um, you'll notice on the staff reports tonight that the subject line in almost every case and almost every item is only two or three or four words. And this, I think, is helpful uh, for the general public trying to understand what's going on here on these uh, topics. and. Uh, sometimes in the past, the uh, subject line was uh, identical with the description, and these were long and wordy kind of things. And so it's a small matter, but uh, I think anything that makes the uh, agendas and the staff reports more accessible to the public, I think, is a step in the right direction. So I appreciate um, the uh, movement in that way. The second item I'd like to um, only mention is um, I'd be interested in my colleagues' uh, opinions, thoughts on term limits um, here in, in our um, government, our local government. And so uh, I don't ask for any staff 
work on that. But I'd like that to be on the agenda. And you know, it's not an agenda item now. But I'd be interested in hearing what your ideas are on that. So if we could get that on the agenda at the next opportunity, I would appreciate that. All right, thank you. Council Member Krauss. Yes, uh, a couple of meetings ago I brought up uh, an issue about uh, publicizing the amounts of money and the people who are asking and making exorbitant uh, public record requests. And uh, what I would like to do is uh, see if the city staff would bring back something for the council dis to discuss and decide whether we're going to adopt that policy. Thank you very much. Staff, you're clear on that? Thank you. Vice Mayor Dunsford. Nothing tonight. Thank you. Um, I was going to, uh, a, a word that Councilmember Williams used relative to the staff reports is accessibility. I'd like to remind the community that all of our documents, all of our uh, minutes, video recordings, etc., of meetings are all available to every single Calistogan or anyone who has access to the internet um, at any and all times on our website. Um, all of our reports are there. It's easy to access. Um, you can also sign up for automatic reminders and postings. Uh, there is nothing to hide here, folks. It's all right there, so you don't act surprised. Um, it is also our responsibility as a city to inform the public, but you as the public and as a voter are responsible for also helping to inform yourselves as to what's going on in your community uh, under which we bid service for you. So with that said, we will now move on to um, proclamations, presentations, and awards. Oh, I'm sorry, we skipped right after the, right over the city manager. <laughs> city manager report, city manager Kern. My Good evening, apologies. Mayor, Council Members, Mike Kern, city manager. Um, some quick items. Um, yesterday, representatives from the company that's going to be putting in the sirens uh, came into town unbeknownst to us and made some pavement markings where they thought the sirens were supposed to go. Unfortunately, they were using some old antiquated data uh, that was in error. Uh, the two areas in question, one is on off of Cedar near Rancho D, and the other is off of Grant near Mora. Um, the, the one near Mora is probably the closest to where the final um, landing will be, but your council has provided direction to staff that there will be three sirens, one at the Public Works courtyard, one at or near the Logby Pool, and one on Grant at or near Greenwood. So I want to make it clear to the community that those are the three locations that the council has approved and the oversight on the cons on the installation company was in error and I want to apologize for anybody that got upset over that. Uh, this evening, um, one of our contractors will be starting night work on Foothill Boulevard uh, to do an emergency repair on a water line. Uh, your council approved that contract at the last meeting. Um, it's taken a little bit for them to get their parts ready. Uh, all the work will be done at night because of the impacts to traffic during the day. Uh, the work is scheduled to be completed by next Thursday. So if you're traveling in that area on Foothill uh, between Elm and Spring, please pay attention to the traffic control signage and anybody that might be out there directing traffic. Um, a reminder, March 18th um, is the Mayor's Forum. Uh, we'll be focusing on topics that are um, important to the, our Hispanic community. That'll be at 6 o'clock here. And then lastly, um, our March 3rd council meeting will be canceled um, because the community center will be used as a voting center. And I'd like to encourage anybody that's eligible to vote uh, to get out and exercise your civic um, responsibilities. Thank you. Thank you. Moving, moving on to proclamations, presentations, and awards. Um, first, we'll actually, I'm just going to hand the whole thing over to uh, Chief Salaya. Looks like all three points are yours. Uh, item number one, Dispatcher and Officer of the Year Awards. That will be followed by, well, we'll start with that one. That's a good start. Chief, welcome back. Thank you. Honorable Mayor, City Council members, City Manager, and City Clerk, thank you for having me this evening. I have the honor of, uh, of making a couple announcements. The first one is our 2019 Officer of the Year and Dispatcher of the Year. 
Uh, unfortunately, our dispatch of the year had another engagement. Her son had a basketball game. I think they're in some sort of finals or something, so we wish them the best of luck on that. But if I could have um, Officer Ryan Jung step, uh, step up this way. Um, as I speak about uh, Officer Dispatcher Griselda Losa, she's our dispatcher of the year this year. Griselda is, uh, is a 14-year veteran dispatcher, and you've heard me talk about the dispatchers a number of times up here and uh, what a critical role that they play. I mean, they're literally the, the face and the voice of the police department. If you call for assistance, 911 or business lines, they're the ones that are going to pick up. If you go to the front counter, they're the ones that are going to greet you. So they literally are the face and the voice of, of the police department and do an outstanding job for us. And Griselda has is, uh, stepped up and actually set herself aside from other dispatchers last year and was uh, awarded Dispatch of the Year. This is an award that comes from her peers along with input from me. Um, many, a number of things were said about Griselda. One about her professionalism, her assistance of helping officers. She's been crucial in some of the investigations that we've had this year, um, which led to her being subpoenaed by the DA's office. She wasn't too thrilled about that, but hey, that goes with the job. So uh, I just want to congratulate uh, Griselda. And we have a nice plaque for her, but again, uh, she's, uh, she knows where her priorities are, and she's uh, at a basketball game cheering her son on. The Officer of the Year is uh, Ryan Jung, who is behind me. Uh, Ryan is a three-year veteran, and in his short three years, he's made quite the impact here at the police department. He quite often leads our department in activity. Uh, there were a number of comments that were made about Ryan, one about his enthusiasm, smile. Just If you ever have contact with him, whether you get stopped or you're going to get a ticket or not a ticket, you're going to see the smile on this guy. Uh, he's... Uh, you probably have not seen a lot of them because since he's been here, he's found his way to graveyard shift. And so when the sun comes up, he goes away. And when the sun comes down, he checks in. And so uh, Ryan has done an outstanding job. And uh, I'm pleased to announce him as Officer of the Year and to present him with the Officer of the Year plaque. and encourage him to say anything he would like to, since it's his moment. <laughs> well, I would like to thank my, uh, my wife back there for putting up for me not being at home all the time, and also my dog that just barked too. So. <laughs> uh, also, thank you to the city for giving me the opportunity to work for this wonderful city. Uh, I love it here. The community is great, and I think my dog said it's time to go. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Ryan. <laughs> Ryan, thank you very much for your service and to your family and your wife. Thank you for sharing him with us. We appreciate it. Um, maybe next time, in, ter in terms of photographers go, somebody a little more subtle than Nick <laughs> creeping around behind the screen. <laughs> Sorry, Chief, go ahead. That's quite all right. So the next, an next announcement, so as you know, uh, the last city council meeting, we said... Uh, not really a goodbye, but uh, good luck into future endeavors to Sergeant Matt Freeze, who retired. And so with that came a vacancy, and uh, it was a difficult, well, actually it was not a difficult decision to make to find someone to fill his shoes. And so for now, I've appointed an acting sergeant, and I would like to call up Sergeant Christine Romo up to the podium. So at the moment, this, act, this is an acting position, but has the full rights and privileges as a full-time sergeant. And so we're going to get to a selection process, but for right now, we have, there's a void we need to get filled. And uh, Christy is that person to do that. She's a 17-year veteran. I have to say, I was, I was looking at the schedule and the officers. With the exception of one officer, one sergeant, Christy will, has and will be training every, have trained every officer on the department. So Impressive. I'm not saying she's old or anything. <laughs> she's been around for a while, but she's been here for 17 years. She's done a number of things for us. Uh, she has been our property and evidence person, which is quite the task in addition to being a, an officer. Uh, she's been our field training officer uh, for how many years? Eight. Enough to train everybody in the organization, including myself. Um, she's now the field training manager. So she stepped into uh, Matt's 
uh, shoes. That's, that's those are going to be large shoes to fill. But uh, I'm have the utmost confidence she's she'll do a great job. She's had a number of awards. One of them is life saving award in the past. Uh, a number of combinations. Just really too many to 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 mix. So, uh, but with the announcement, Calistoga has this tradition. When the last sergeant leaves, and the new sergeant comes on board, that last sergeant presents sergeant's bars. And so with that. Retired Sergeant Matt Fries is joining us to present Christy with the sergeant bars that get, have gotten passed on for at least a couple decades is what I'm going to guess. Yes, Chief, I wouldn't want to out Sergeant O'Neill, but these were originally his. Um, there's been, uh, well, now six sergeants in the history of the city of Calistoga. I was the fifth, and uh, Sergeant Romo will be the sixth, and the first woman. So these bars have been passed down to each sergeant, and it's going to be her responsibility to hold on to them until the next sergeant. I've held on them for the last 12 years, and now it's your turn. All right. Thank you. Give me 20. <laughs> I just want to say thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I hope that I can um, lead my team well and be a good mentor. Um, I have a great team right now. We're almost full staff again, so I'm really excited to be in this position. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, retired Sergeant Freeze, congratulations on the opening of your new endeavor. All yours, Chief. Last one. Okay. Uh, if I can, uh, so. I have the pleasure to add another one to our force. Now, if I can ask Amanda Green to step this way, up next to me. So I'm going to let her do some introductions, but I first want to say that uh, uh, it's a pleasure to bring Amanda Green on board as our newest officer. She actually started on uh, February 10th, Monday, uh, with an orientation. I think she had one full shift, so this week will be her first full shift with, uh, with actually Sergeant Romo, lucky her, she, she drew the prize. Um, Amanda is originally from Southern California, uh, currently lives in Sonoma County for the last, uh, since 2014. Uh, she's a graduate from the Santa Rosa Police Academy in the spring of last year, so recently graduated. I think she might have some friends here uh, to uh, support her. And uh, she doesn't really want to speak, and so, but, I'm going to allow her to introduce because I believe she has some special friends and some family that uh, I think need to be uh, identified in the audience. First of all, thank you so much for this. This is why I didn't want to speak. <laughs> <laughs> I'm incredibly grateful to be here. I worked really hard, but it takes more than that. And I have an incredible support system. I mean, classmates. Family, my dad's LAPD, standing back there. My extended family, new family, my daughter, right there. Um, I'm very, very lucky, and I'm just so excited to start a long career here. Um, I feel so right, and um, I'm not sure what else to say besides that. It really sums it up. I'm, I'm lucky, and I'm worked hard to be here, and I'm incredibly grateful. Thank you. Thank you. And she did a way better job than I would have done, and she was a lot more succinct than I would have been. So there you go. It's a win-win. So part of that is, uh, is although she, she had a, an official swearing in now, there's the formal one, so that uh, the city clerk will read her the oath. 
I have a badge for her to get pinned. Is her badge is being ordered, so this isn't her real badge, but this is a badge that uh, will get us through tonight. Uh, and then she'll get to choose who she would like to pin her badge on when she's finished with the oath. Follow Kendall's in Okay. <laughs> I, Amanda Green, do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California, that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter. Thank you. And we'll get you a gun later. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm not going to make her say anything else. Uh, all, right. all right. Thank you very much, City Council. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Officer you. Green, thank you for choosing us to uh, have your career here in Calistoga. We sincerely appreciate that. Um, Sergeant Romo, thank you for your continued work here in Calistoga. Um, you've done a fantastic job um, with all the work you've done for us, so we sincerely appreciate that. Ryan, keep up the good work. Um, we are very fortunate, and Amanda, you are joining an incredible team of officers, uh, dispatchers, uh, with a lot of support from this community, and we appreciate all that you will be doing for us. You sounds like you come from a law enforcement family, so you know exactly what you're in store for. Uh, so to Dad, thanks for uh, sharing her with us. We appreciate that very much. All right, so I'm giving you your 60-second warning. You have 60 seconds to vacate or you stay for the entire meeting. <laughs> Thank you all. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to acknowledge Chief Savaya also for working hard to assemble Absolutely. a high quality uh, police department here for us. Very well said. Thank you. All right. Moving on, we will I'll entertain a motion on the consent calendar as presented unless anyone would like an item pulled. Uh, I'd like to pull number five, please. All right, item number five. I'll entertain a motion on item number four as presented. So moved. Second. We have a motion by Vice Mayor Dunsford, a second by uh, Council Member Lopez Ortega. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, item number five, consideration of amendments to 
Calistoga Municipal Code Chapter 15.50, Building Standards Appeals and Advisory Board. The recommended action is to consider adoption of the ordinance number 745. Councilmember Williams, you asked for this to be pulled. Thank you. Yes, I do appreciate uh, staff's uh, bringing this to our attention that there was difficulty in um, assembling uh, a, a committee large enough to make decisions, and uh, staff made uh, good recommendations which uh, amount to shrinking the size of the committee and also to relaxing the qualifications and I agree with both of those and I appreciate uh, you bringing those to our attention as I mentioned the other day um, I think uh, term limits are important uh, in order to um, increase uh, enhance uh, participation of the public and so um, I can't agree with the um, the elimination of the term limit requirement which was here and I think that uh, the two steps we're taking shrinking the size of the committee and relaxing the qualifications will probably um, will probably provide us with enough uh, quality input that we won't need to relax that um, requirement for uh, term limits so um, it's the same point I made before that uh, we want to maximize uh, maximize participation and thereby connect uh, the public even more to their government so I um, I agree with the uh, first two measures those two measures but I can't agree with the uh, elimination of term limits okay um, I've, we've had this conversation and, yeah. and I'll just share again that when you come into smaller communities, you're often challenged by the pool of people willing and capable to serve in these roles. And the more restrictions we put on and term limits are a restriction, uh, the more complicated it can be. But I appreciate your position. Um, unless there is anyone else wishing to address this matter. Is, is there any other committee we have that uh, requires term limits, has term limits? I think this is the only one. So it seems a appropriate to keep it consistent with the other standing committees. Okay. Anyone else, in council members? Did, uh, did we had a lot of applicants for this special committee? Not in the past, which is the reason we've made some other modifications in addition to it. And we've been in a position where you've actually not been able to meet quorum or make quorum. Uh, and it's a committee that doesn't meet very frequently, so it's not as if the time burden is, uh, is significant. There were some qualification requirements that we are relaxing as well. I think they meet once or twice a year. Yep. Anyone in the public wishing to address this matter? All right, I'll close public comment. Um, I will entertain the motion as presented. So moved. Second. We have a motion by Vice Mayor Dunsford. We have a second by Council Member Krause. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, opposed. Thank you very much. Moving on to item number six. This is a public hearing. Continue public hearing on the draft updated infrastructure element of the Calistoga General Plan and rescission of the geothermal element. The recommended action is to receive any additional public comments on the draft infrastructure element update and provide appropriate direction to staff. Um, as you may recall, we opened public hearing on this matter at the last city council meeting, and we continued it through today. So taking us through this will be Planning and Building Director Lynn Goldberg. Director Goldberg, <coughs> welcome back. Thank you. I don't really have anything to add. It was continued to give uh, opportunity for additional information. Uh, input on possibly rescinding the geothermal element and folding some of the information about geothermal resources into the infrastructure element. So this was continued to give the public um, additional opportunity for input. And we, one of the recommendations is that we will be obviously including the geothermal element to um, the infrastructure, correct? Well, I had suggested some recommended language um, that could be added to address those concerns. I shared that at the last hearing. Um, it could be folded into the infrastructure element and that's where it was left there wasn't any direction as to whether to go ahead and add that information and go ahead and rescind the geothermal element as a standalone or not there was no conclusion just a continuance for additional public input okay 
Uh, with that, unless council members have anything to add, I'll reopen the public hearing on this. All right. Is there anyone in the public wishing to address this matter? Please share with us your name and your address, should you so choose, but you're not required to do so. No problem. Diane Barrett. <clears throat> Excuse me. Allergies. 1567 Centennial. I'll try not to um, repeat myself. I, as you know, um, through my emails and speaking last time, would really like to see a standalone geothermal element left in the general plan, even if it is only one or two pages. I know that staff has done a great job culling out some of the less than currently per pertinent information and putting it in the general, um, in the infrastructure element. However, I see that as more the negative aspects of the geothermal whereas the geothermal element can address and show the community the importance of that resource to this community. Several things that were left out that I would like to see included are the necessity and the importance of purity of the geothermal waters. It was mentioned in the current element, geothermal element that the purity is important for bottling companies, of which we don't have three anymore. However, the spa industry depends on the purity of the geothermal water. So I think that statement and that protection is important. Um, it's improbable that we're going to have three, let alone many more, bottling companies in town. It could be possible, however, and I have heard that the geothermal wells are going to be reactivated at Crystal Geyser. So again, the purity of that water is important to address and to let the community know that we care about that. I still believe that geothermal or the volcanic ash protection should be somewhere. It's truly not a geothermal resource, but I know nowhere else in the general plan where that can be addressed. And I might mention that at the last public hearing on this matter and tonight, if you notice, the badges of the police department, front and center, geothermal water. Thank you very much. Um, anyone else wishing to address the council on this matter? Mr. Quast. Welcome back. Thank you. Michael Quast, 1300 Washington Street. Um, I don't know if you had a chance to get my late afternoon letter or to read it. Um, if you have, let me know so I can be more brief. Um, <clears throat> but basically, I started out that it was unfortunate that the staff report two weeks ago on the 4th failed to recognize the enormous benefit of the geothermal resource and basically highlighted its presence as a nuisance to the sewers issue. Um, the geothermal water users are one of the largest contingent of jobs in town. They also bring in huge amount of people that all the other businesses benefit from also. Um, <clears throat> and this town is a spa town. It its creation and persona has existed for 160 years uh, plus on the idea of being a spa town. And um, we are one of the largest concentration of hot springs and spas on the West Coast. Um, I think it's important that the city council and staff should be supporting the existing uh, geothermal users. We endeavor to be good stewards of the resource and I think also that the geothermal water should be celebrated for their uniqueness and their continued reputation as a special spa and relaxation destination. Um, in the past, we warranted special treatment, and I think that should continue. I think removing it is not a wise step. Um, as with any resource, there are responsibilities and caveats. But I think with the help of staff and the city in a cooperative mode, these can be managed instead of being vilified. And uh, I also know that you have a lot of 
pressure from state agencies and that needs to be managed and I think you have to be more proactive in that in your lobbying and other things because sometimes things set forth as levels don't have full scientific basis and I think that your lobbying efforts could bring a lot of that stuff to light and help you out as such I appeal to the council's wisdom to recognize the importance and the benefit of the geothermal resource and to continue a geothermal element probably would in my view be best if you had a city council subcommittee meet with the geothermal users to delineate a cooperative geothermal element but barring that I've given you some suggestions in um, red that are in uh, the letter that I sent you, you have 10 Based seconds Michael <laughs> I think this is an important issue. I think that um, there are um, the aspects of one supporting the unique geothermal resources and the longevity and that the city needs to be in a co cooperative mode with helping and assisting the users to mitigate <coughs> the adverse impacts. And I think working together is better than just going to each individual because things can be done in a cooperative uh, method. I think also there is an atmosphere in this town of basically our spas and rural relaxation that's important to continue and I think it we all recognize that and we all enjoy it and I think that is something also to be supported and it needs to be noted in the policies and actions. Um, <clears throat> Thank you, Michael. Well, I do want to say the one last thing is that I think you, you need to put more efforts in with being proactive um, on the state level, whether that requires a consultant or a better ombudsman for yourselves. But I think that that should also be another added uh, policy and action. Because I think in the long run, it'll help you be ahead of the game. Because um, it's hard just getting told you have to do something different when it may not be it's very gray at times thank you very much thank you thank you anyone else yes please Bruce Kendall uh, 1713 Lake Street <clears throat> I just wanted to also just talk a little more about the geothermal from the, the history Calistoga has been a geothermal town from the very beginning it was geothermal before it's here geyser is an amazing place and uh, we have uh, an amazing situation as far as this Germith geothermal aquifer right under us and we've been using it for all these years as a health resort a health spa area and uh, we were known for many years I think we still are as the hot springs of the West so I think we should we should continue to as the other people have just said to support the geothermal resource and there's there's ways we can do if things differently to make it better like Golden Haven right now has a reinjection system which I think uh, is a tremendous value and I think we should encourage uh, other places to look into that we have a, a really close relationship which, uh, Golden Haven does now with the state of California and uh, they're very pleased with how we've done things and uh, that's another point that some of the some of the information about the geothermal resource is, is not very correct uh, there's been a lot of talk in the past about how the geothermal water is toxic it has all these problems and it does have problems for a lot of plants it is completely non-toxic for any kind of animals and the geothermal has been running into the Napa River for thousands of years and there's no reason why it shouldn't continue to do that. Uh, many years ago, when we were in conversation with the state of California and, and the city, uh, we had a third party, I think it was Caltest, I can't remember now, years ago, came and took geothermal water from the Golden Haven Wells, and they were testing it because there was concern about it being in the river and was it going to affect the wildlife. And they tested it at different uh, concentrations until they had it up to 100% mineral water and not one fish died, not one. So the, the fish and game at that time uh, saw this report. They didn't like the results, so they just dismissed it. And uh, it's this thing that I see happening sometimes that it gets off and we're trying to 
protect the environment from the environment. This is a natural situation in Calistoga. It's been for hundreds of thousands of years. And I don't think we have a bad situation. Maybe we have a good situation. So I'd like to see the geothermal resource continue, expand. And it has to be done in a way that, that we, can, we can save it and, and uh, utilize it safely. And I think there's a lot of potential for it. And I still think it's uh, probably the number one draw to Calistoga. It come from the spots. All right, well, thank you. Thank you very much. And Bruce, I have been in a meeting where the state of California referenced your facility in particular as a model of how you've managed the geothermal elements. So congratulations for the work you, for the work you guys have done there. <coughs> Anyone else wishing to address this matter? Yes, Charlotte. Charlotte Williams, 59 View Road. Um, it occurs to me uh, that I don't often hear about the geothermal being used as an alternate energy source and yet I was at a music event in Santa Rosa a few weeks ago and someone said so why doesn't Calistoga make use of that you've got solar potential there and you've got geothermal potential you know why should you be reliant on PG&E or any other power company when you have a lot of pot potential right there in town so I thought I'd just bring that up and I don't know if it's addressed in the current uh, geothermal element in the general plan but it seems like it ought to be Thanks. thank you and we have been in recent discussions uh, from microgrid concepts that are looking into utilization of geothermal for energy production as well anyone else all right I will close public comment and I'll bring it back to the council um, for further discussion who would like to start so unless there's a compelling reason that we adopt this tonight I'd be interested in allowing the public the speakers tonight um, offer their greater input suggest changes uh, revisions and and uh, we want to try to respond to everybody in the public and uh, so I'd be interested in unless there's some reason that we just have to do this now in getting their input and and considering it and going from there thank you anyone else I agree with the speakers that uh, geothermal is a very important aspect of this community, always has been, always will be. And I think it's probably worthy of uh, an update rather than a rescission uh, of the element in the general plan. I did uh, like the idea to do a suit committee and uh, discuss this more further. So, um uh, um, this element can be um, mentioned um, or adopted better and um, and listen to all the parts and and, and create a win-win situation because uh, geothermal is is for sure uh, very important for this town. Uh, so I, I agree with everything that's been said. Um, I think there absolutely should be a, a standalone geothermal element, even if it's mostly symbolic in nature. Um, but there are opportunities, such as energy, as Charlotte mentioned. I know we uh, looked into uh, using geothermal to heat the pool at one point in time, but the cost was and it was complicated and very expensive. Um, but technologies change, so in the future there might be opportunities. Uh, but my suggestion would be we should wrap up the infrastructure element um, and, and then shift the geothermal to a standalone and I think city staff should uh, work with um, the speakers to uh, formulate uh, a geothermal element and just bring it back if there needs to be a subcommittee that's fine um, it seems like it's something that could happen pretty quickly and we, we should not lose sight of the fact that we are a spa town I would echo that and I would like to say see uh, the geothermal element be freestanding uh, as, a, as a separate element and I think we have staff who understand that and agree with that um, I would say let's separate the two let's go ahead and move forward with the updated infrastructure element with the caveat that the freestanding geothermal element will follow send it back to Planning Commission allow for public hearing input we could even consider 
um, subcommittee to enhance that element, add in some things that have changed, um, and then bring that back um, uh, to be adopted separately. Um, I'll make that recommendation and then staff can tell me um, if that's possible. Um, but I, I did want to uh, key on a comment made by uh, Mr. Quast, which I completely agree with. And we can, as representatives of this city, do a better job advocating the elements of geothermal at the state level. But I would strongly suggest and encourage the industry to do some of that advocacy and education locally in our own community because I have been to some of these state meetings where locals were pressuring state agencies to come down harder on and vilifying was a word used the geothermal industry and that's from people who are here so I think there needs to be some work done some reach out to encourage people and educate folks on what this water does or does not do um, because having sit sat and watched that occur um, in a community where that's what you were created to do uh, or originated from uh, was a little bit disheartening so um, I'll take some pushback to go to some of those agencies if you'll take some of that responsibility and help educate uh, our friends and neighbors on that one um, staff can we separate these two Yes, please do. <laughs> uh, yes, I. That's um, a common concern, entirely appropriate, and um, we've prepared a resolution that would allow us to close out the infrastructure element um, as it is, without any additional language. Um, we had multiple hearings on that, and um, we'll move forward with an updated geothermal geothermal element, keeping it a standalone element. Uh, so the resolution you're receiving basically strikes out and rescinding the general plan geothermal element and then in any references um, to that portion um, throughout the resolution and it just adds uh, that there was a continued public hearing on February 18th and changes the adoption date to February 18th. So I would highly encourage you to, um, if you feel it's appropriate, adopt the infrastructure element tonight. As I noted, we've been working on this for years, and it would be great to have it closed out and moved on. And we'd be more than happy to work with the public and the stakeholders on an updated geothermal element, maintaining it as a separate element. And what would that timeline look like on the freestanding geothermal element? I actually, have have one, I actually have one drafted, but um, you know that that could be sent out for public review or if there is a desire to have a subcommittee I'm not sure we necessarily need a council subcommittee uh, we know the stake you know most of the stakeholders in the um, in the community so um, we could show them the draft and use it as a starting point for more discussion and we could take the suggested additions and um, so Do you have to even go through planning commission yes or? we would have to go through planning commission it would be just like we did through the for the updated infrastructure element we would just have a separate hearing on the updated geothermal element once we have a draft that you know most of the folks are um, satisfied with which I would encourage because another public hearing allows more right. airing of what the yeah. modifications might be off more opportunity for people to contribute right it's not that difficult we could just you know take you know take our time it's not a huge rush um, and you know take a take a few weeks to draft it and then work with everybody and then go through planning commission and they'll make a recommendation to you so it'll come back to you eventually for adoption so my only concern there would be and and somebody needs to bird dog this is if we separate them mm -hmm. adopt one we want to make sure that we're still paying yes. attention and that is working through the process and the time yep. I'm gonna look over here now because you'll be retired by then it's on the whiteboard <laughs> <laughs> it's on our project whiteboard C I City have manager so <laughs> I did draft it last week it's, okay. it's, it's, I'm trying to leave it all in order so okay with that understood is the council comfortable with just moving on um, <clears throat> the infrastructure plan uh, with the caveat that a freestanding geothermal element will be crafted recrafted adopted and, and attached to I'm fine with that. I do have some comments 
on the uh, infrastructure plan, but I'm fine with the separation. Okay. Everyone else fine if we separate? I am. General public okay with that? All right. Uh, questions on the element itself? Councilmember Williams. Yes. Um, I'm going to uh, page 23 of 33. Um, on the top of the, is the numbering the same on yours, Ms. Goldberg? Uh, Possibly. <laughs> okay. And it's also um, I-20 or oh, page okay. 41 of 542. Okay. Derek, do you have that? Okay. Um, and I'm at the top of the page, A4.1-3 uh, refers to an action under the goal of pursuing the installation and monitoring of volcanic ash mud separators at resorts and spas in order to avoid or minimize the amount of antimony discharged into the wastewater treatment system. And my question is, do you know if that's being done? That is being done and we are requiring it already of resorts and spas. Great, thank you. And I have one a uh, minor um, a word uh, change, I think, on page 29 of 33. This is at this is a small thing, but this is a formal document, and uh, at the uh, end of the very first paragraph, where Calistoga, uh, the name Calistoga, has continued to invoke associations. I think we want to use evoke and not invoke. Um, thank you for noting that. However, attachment two is moot at this point. We're not going to be adding this okay, language great. to the infrastructure element. Got so, it. And then my last. But we'll make a note of that if we yeah. use it in the next one. And my last question is on um, pages 14 and 21. Uh, page 14 of 33 and page 21 of 33. And on page 14 of 33, uh, up towards the top, uh, item P 1.3-6. If and when 95% of the capacity of the existing water storage supply distribution system has been reached, Further development in Calistoga is prohibited until the city has provided sufficient new capacity to accommodate new development. So the cutoff line, the recommended cutoff line is 95% there regarding the water supply. And on page 21, there's the same 95% um, uh, cutoff point regarding the uh, wastewater flow. And we, we had a little bit of email correspondence there, and, and my question was how that 95% was arrived at. And, and I agree that it's prudent to, um, as the language says, prohibit um, further development when a certain capacity is reached, either in water or sewer. And my question is, uh, my thinking is the 95% is cutting it pretty close. Um, we have, you know, the water supplies have been uh, variable, unpredictable. Droughts um, are um, not predictable. And if, if we're building up to 95% of our capacity of water or wastewater usage, we're cutting it pretty close. And I, it's not hard to imagine, given the variability, unpredictability of the weather, it's not hard to imagine uh, construction being approved and having us reach that 95% threshold and people looking at this going, what are we doing building more and more construction of one kind or another, residential, commercial, whatever? Um, what are we doing building that if we're this close to capacity in our water and our wastewater? And so, um, so I appreciate the, that we want to be prudent about that and I'm thinking that something like 80 or 85 percent threshold or at least down to 90 percent threshold would be more prudent yet rather than cut it so close rather than get to that 95 percent capacity before we actually say well maybe we better
stop on this on this construction. Director Goldberg, what was the source of the 95 figure? Is that a common practice or Derek? Common Thank practice you. by other municipalities. Where does that source come from? Just generally um, good engineering practice. Introduce yourself, Derek. Derek, uh, <laughs> Thank Public you. Works Director for Calistoga. Sorry. Derek. Derek Rayner. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, yes, good in engineering practice, um, uh, you know, 95%, um, you know, to make sure that you're not over, over promising um, for, you know, water and wastewater capacity in the long run. So that is an industry marker or standard or common practice? Give me some. I believe... I believe there's um, even with the regional board I think they do have a requirement that's a little bit before the 95 before you reach that capacity um, that they will require that you start doing some studies you start doing some engineering and some preparation in advance of hitting that 95 percent target it would seem to me they would have a specific number because the state mandates that you grow as a town can't just if you were to take that percentage and make it 30 percent like that would be a way to basically stop or regulate growth which the state doesn't allow you to do but you obviously can't grow beyond your resources or they come in and they mandate that you expand your capacity in one way or another correct so it would seem to me that we should find out what that number is and if it's lower than 95, you know, we could certainly lower it to that, whatever that number is. In the past, the weather was, seemed a little bit more predictable, but now we're in a different, different place. And um, I, I can imagine in 20 years, this may not come into play at all, of course. It's something of a theoretical question, but I can imagine 20 years from now, you know, the drought, some drought coming along, and people looking back and saying, what were they thinking, allowing the town to build up to 95% of its water or wastewater capacity. Uh, I think prudence says to go with a lower number. I think 85, but I would, you know, I would go to 90 and feel even better at 85%. I think your, your question is a fair one. You know, what's the source of the 95? Um, it does seem, I share the opinion, it seems pretty close to <laughs> Full capacity, yeah, full capacity. Uh, before kind of the warning flares go off. Mm. Um, and then to Vice Mayor Dunsford's point, is there a state <coughs> recommended best practice or number? Because otherwise you would be dialing back your number to avoid state growth, required growth allotments. Mm. Um, so do we have... I believe, I believe it is 85%, but don't quote me on that. It might be a little higher than that, but... Um, that the Regional Water Quality Control Board has for wastewater. Okay, so if we don't have defini a definitive number as we sit here today, um, then can, is this something we can have brought back to us? Derek, you kind of lost a little track here. You said it's 85% on wastewater, or is it 85% also on potable water? On wastewater. On wastewater, okay. One, wastewater. one of the concerns I have is um, uh, with the statewide housing shortage is we narrowly dodged the SB 50 bullet here uh, a little while ago and the people who are concerned about the housing issue in Sacramento are sure to make some additional rules uh, that we may or may not agree with um, I, I agree with uh, with Mike that uh, if we put it low that uh, there might be a perception on some state regulators part that we are artificially trying to or we're, we're trying to get around a uh, state requirement of not allocating water the way we used to so um, uh, I don't have a problem going to 90 percent um, but I want to make sure that we're not buying ourselves a different kind of a problem uh, 
uh, with the state. So uh, I'm okay with 90%. I'd, I'd be okay if there's a compelling reason to stay with, uh, with 95%. So for me, if we can't, and until we can demonstrate a best practice or there's a marker somewhere out there, whether we say it's 95 or 90 or 85, it's no different than where we are on the 95 right now. We're guessing. So as a takeaway. I think it, one thing maybe to clarify too, perhaps, is that, you know, if you're talking about, you know, mandating no development at all, that may be different than, you know, the regional board's probably going to tell us before that happens to start preparing, doing calculations, master planning, making sure that, you know, we're well prepared to have that additional capacity in the future. They're going to be forewarning on, uh, us of that ahead of the 95%. Okay, so let's find out what that looks like and bring it back, educate us, educate the public. I mean, at this point, uh, unless someone can demonstrate to me that there's a reason it's 95 Let's let's bring this back. Sure. Thank you. Understood. Yep. Um, so, council members. So, are you saying let's approve this as is, and then come staff will come back if there's a different number, or we're going to just we'd have to punt this until the next until we have some information that clarifies or helps us set a figure that's more comfortable or at least that is um, a best practice well I'm also just kind of listening to what Lynn was saying like let's kind of move on like we're, we're done we're kind of hung up on a, sp a specific number do we just agree to knock it back to 90 staff can do the research we can make the change if we want to in the future, but just get this off the off our plate. There's no rush to have to have this. Is there okay. a deadline we have to meet? No, no, sir. Okay. Okay. Because otherwise, we're going to pass a resolution with exactly. information that we're not comfortable, comfortable with. So. Okay. So I'll entertain a motion on this item. Um, or we, by consensus, we can agree to move it. Uh, sorry, continue, continue it. Continue the item. Remand it back to our staff for okay. Well, that that means we're continuing the public hearing as well. That now we'll close the public hearing. We'll remand back to staff to give us to qualify the number ninety five. Share with us other best practices, and which point we'll allow for public comment on that element of it. That's fine. Thank you. Council okay with that? I'm all right. Yes. That's fine. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lynn. Sorry about that. <laughs> Moving on, item number seven under general government. Consideration of a, but but just to clarify, there will be a separation of the geothermal element as a freestanding part of this. So, there. Item number seven, consideration of a contract with Anchor Point Group LLC to prepare a wildfire risk assessment and provide related services. The recommended action is consider adopting a resolution authorizing the city manager to execute a consultant services agreement with Anchor Point and approving a budget adjustment in an amount not to exceed $80,800 subject to any modifications to the work scope deemed appropriate by the city council taking us through this item will be planning and building director lynn goldberg thank you and i'd also like to note that uh fire chief steve campbell is with us tonight as well this was um a joint effort among uh myself and uh, brad cannon the building official so as you recall on november 19th when you were considering um a updating the uh, building standards code to reflect the new California code. Council member Kraus uh, expressed concern about the potential for a wildland fire spreading throughout the county. Um, he uh, expressed support for um, applying building code chapter 7A, which is called materials and construction methods for exterior wildfire exposure to the entire community. Um, and there was further discussions about um, whether that was legally supportable, what the construction costs could be associated with that. Um, 
what the thresholds for triggering fire resistive construction would be, potential concerns from stakeholders, uh, the fact that Chapter 7A is tied to specific fire hazard maps that exclude much of the area within the city limits, and um, questions were asked about whether any other jurisdictions have taken this approach. So um, I'm just going to take you through a, a couple slides to uh, explain how we got to this proposal for wild land risk assessment and related services from Anchor Point. Um, so in the uh, city limits of Calistoga, which is this black line around here, there is a section that is south of Foothill that is designated by Cal Fire as being in a very high fire hazard severity zone. Uh, this other red area, this is really all red. It's just been kind of pinked out for the area that's in the city limits. So everything also south and to Sonoma County is red. Um, there are also areas of high fire hazard area, this orange color that's been mapped by Cal Fire outside the city limits, as well as yellow areas, um, which are moderate hazard areas. So within the city limits of any jurisdiction, Cal Fire just maps the very high fire hazard area, and we must administer Chapter 7A for any construction in that area. However, the white area with the, within the rest of the city limits um, has not been evaluated in terms of high or moderate risk and we don't really have a means at the staff level to um, do that the Cal Fire does modeling for all of the other areas within the state responsibility area they don't do the modeling for the local responsibility areas so um, just briefly chapter 7a requires um, this is all in your written staff report I just wanted to pull a couple slides for the public um, there are a number of um, fire resistive things, construction items that have to be included for construction in areas that are subject to 7A, including the roofs, the gutters, the attic, the, and the exterior cladding of the walls, certain types of windows, certain types of doors, and decking and stair treads and other surfaces that are outside have to be ignition resistant or built with heavier fire retardant treated lumber. So there are a number of um, measures that are mandated by Chapter 7A in the very high hazard areas. Um, we looked, uh, did some research since November 19th, uh, talked to some local contractors. Their best guess is that these additional fire resistive um, measures increase the cost of a local project by approximately 15%. Uh, however, insurance costs for buildings employing these uh, measures could be lower. There are some suggestions that the, light, that the insurance costs could go down. We asked, um, we did, we looked around to other jurisdictions in the Bay Area. There are no local jurisdictions that are applying Chapter 7A to areas that are not designated as very high fire hazard zone. So they don't have a blanket um, application to um, throughout a city limit or certain areas of the city limit. Uh, we did talk to Santa Rosa and Sonoma County. They are not imposing the Chapter 7A measures in the rebuild areas of Coffee Park or Mark West Springs. They are not subject to 7A. They weren't subject to Chapter 7A before the fires either because they just don't have the um, characteristics, topography and wind and vegetation. Of course, we know this was an anomaly and um, what happened. So um, we did find, um, I'm sorry, this should be the city of Dana Point. <laughs> uh, they did take the approach of going ahead and mapping the moderate and high uh, severity zones within their city limits and have designated them Ember Zones 1 and 2. And then uh, they have, uh, they do mandate that new buildings and qualifying alterations and additions must comply with specified provisions of Chapter uh, 7A. So there's a number zone one, and you have that um, handout as part of your packet, and number zone two, and they just kind of layer on certain things that they have sent. They pull out certain components of uh, 7A that have to apply to construction in uh, ember zones one and two. So you can see here the red, the orange, and the yellow zones. So something like that could also um, uh, be applied in the city of Calistoga if we had that knowledge, which we do not have that knowledge. We only have the red zone knowledge. 
So um, we saw a need for a detailed evaluation. We lack the basis to require Chapter 7A provisions throughout the city. We need to identify the moderate and high zones and a more detailed evaluation of what the actual risk is. Um, also, there is a need for um, an update of the CAL FIRE mapping, which was last done in 2008. Uh, the very high fire hazard severity zone within the city limits needs to be reevaluated for possibly being extended or being pulled back. So, since that's uh, more than 10 year old data, and as we know, things have changed, um, that would be another thing that should be looked at. Uh, we also need to have a finer grained uh, approach to this information. CAL FIRE's evaluation is at a very gross level. It's, it needs to be, it's like one third of the state is um, subject to, uh, subject to, is in a high uh, severity zone. So um, they, they can't do it at a parcel level. They, they do it in very large uh, plots. And um, if we had finer grain information, it would help us proactively address wildfire hazards, such as where vegetation might need to be removed. And it could also um, protect residents and property from wildfires to the extent feasible, such as requiring the fire resistive construction in appropriate areas and also planning for evacuation during the wildfire events. Um, so while I was um, researching what other jurisdictions were doing, I came across Aspen, which um, under contract with a firm called Anchor Point, um, can prepared something that uh, Anchor Point calls its no harm model. And it was an assessment of the city's wildfire, wildfire vulnerability, oh my gosh, vulnerability that is scientifically defendable and it could be applied in a consistent manner throughout the city. Um, they are, they have worked and are working with uh, jurisdictions throughout the state of California as well as uh, outside the state in uh, Washington and Colorado and areas like that. They're based in Colorado. Uh, but they're, they just finished a lot of work um, on the San Francisco Peninsula. A number of jurisdictions banded together and hired Anchor Point to do this evaluation for um, a number of jurisdictions there. So um, this is just all of the factors that go into a fire behavior analysis. It's very technical. This whole thing is extremely technical. It's not something that staff uh, could possibly pull off. And um, what is the result of this modeling is that uh, they would come up with areas that they would anticipate to have the highest severity of wildfires um, where they might be most frequent. Again, this is all dependent on vegetation, uh, the steepness of the slope. Uh, did it burn before? What is, you know, what are the patterns from before? And a, a number of other factors. Also, how uh, dry or wet the vegetation is, uh, if there are trees, or is it just grassland? Um, so they get into a very fine detail here. Um, and it can break down into the various neighborhoods so that the ones that, uh, the houses that are on the periphery of a particular subdivision and that are adjacent to vegetation are more susceptible to wildfires than some towards the interior. Of course, we know about embers and that kind of thing too. But um, they're also getting into, this is very interesting, um, looking at wind aligned roads. So they look at the prevailing winds and they found this to be true in Coffee Park that winds that, uh, streets that were perpendicular um, to the <coughs> prevailing wind, some of the houses did a better job than if you were on a street where the wind was going right down, right following that pattern. So they, it's a very complex model that they put all this data in. They can also pop out areas of vegetation, fingers of vegetation within the urban areas that could burn and uh, use that uh, the city could use it in the future for vegetation management. One of the possible corridors could be the Napa River corridor that goes through the city. That could be something we need to be looking at in terms of vegetation management because fire could very easily traverse that corridor. So um, again, what we would end up with if we were to go um, with this kind of analysis would be areas that, like the gray areas that probably aren't at risk under 
all of these various scenarios that they do and the model can change um, we would have the ability to plug in certain factors knowing what's what's happening out there in the real world during an event so it would it would drop out the areas in the middle of town the, those might be subject to smoke and that kind of thing um, then as the colors get darker the darker the pink and the darker purple those are on the interface and the intermix areas where it might be a good idea to have fire resistive construction in those areas because those are going to be most susceptible so again they they show here the ember zones they um and you know just how susceptible areas might be towards burning um, again a very fine-grained analysis popping out the areas that might burn and then they can get down to the parcel level, so you would be able to click on a parcel and you would have a pop-up that shows exactly what zone it's in and a whole bunch of other information. So uh, in addition to the um, evaluation itself to determine the risk of the various areas of the city, Anchor Point also offers additional services. One would be a web map interface, and that could be integrated with the city and fire department websites. Uh, you could generate a neighborhood or a parcel level map along with detailed data. So that could be free to the public to access. Um, they also do evacuation planning. They could identify primary, secondary, and tertiary routes of ingress and egress available and make recommendations for improvements and new evacuation routes. So if we know Cordham Canyon is a possible evacuation route, but it's blocked or it's so, you know, in such poor shape that it's really unusable, then um, they could make recommendations for that kind of thing. Uh, this is a sample map that they made for another jurisdiction. They highlighted the important routes, and then they even, the orange ones are ones that aren't really sanctioned uh, roads or streets, but in an emergency, they could be used to get people out of certain areas. So they would feed all this in as well. Um, they also have something that they call TUFO, which is time until fire arrival modeling. Um, this is an example. They used um, the ignition point was actually in the right in the middle of the colored area, dark red area. And they were able to project based again on winds and fire uh, vegetation loading and that kind of thing, how long the areas have until uh, critical infrastructure is reached or homes or uh, roads. So um, this would be obviously a fluid model that um, the various uh, components could be plugged in there in real time. They also offer interface response plans, which are operationally focused plans for local and incoming resources during an event. So that, of course, we're going to have support coming in from all over. And um, this would allow us to generate these response plans that we could then pass on to the incoming resources. Uh, they would cover the fire department's entire response area. Uh, probably a lot of people don't know that uh, our mutual response area is very large. Here's the city right here. And so it goes up to the crust up here and up into Alexander Valley and into Sonoma County. How many square miles is it? 92 square miles so um, so the response plans could be designed to cover something that was going on in any of those areas um, it's designed for field use and be a source for situational awareness for firefighters it's a decision-making tool for incident commanders during initial attack and also extended attack phases of suppression operations and you can't really read this but this would be a typical thing that would be printed out and would be given to this would be unit one's assignment it would show the location of all the roads the hydrants where the fire is at that particular time and then a plan of action and then unit two is uh, down down here so they would also have a similar plan so there uh, they estimate that would be four to five months uh, from contract initiation to completion of the no harm assessment which would be in time <laughs> for that fall time of year hopefully we won't be uh, in fires but and then I've also broken down the various costs um, the, the initial assessment would be $40,500 uh, 
the web map interface would be another 10,800. And then presentations of the assessment findings at both the city council and at a public meeting would be $6,000. Um, those three tasks are highly recommended. Um, that would give us basic information we need to decide whether to apply Chapter 7A to other parts of the um, city or to break it up like Dana Point where we have certain areas that are, um, are uh, where Chapter 7A certain parts of it would apply and then uh, maybe we, we would end up changing our very high fire hazard uh, area as well. So uh, then there are the optional tasks that uh, that I also outlined the evacuation planning, the interface response plan, and then the total cost would be um, 80800 There would be an ongoing um, annual hosting fee for the web map interface once it's established of $1,500 a year. Um, the current fiscal year budget does not include designated funding for this work. It kind of came up last November. Um, therefore, the funding source would be general fund reserves. Um, and this, um, this work would be consistent with a number of council goals and objectives for this fiscal year, uh, mainly enhancing community disaster preparation, including wildfires, evaluate potential wildfire impacts, educate residents, and prepare for post-fire recovery, uh, develop and adopt local fire codes that exceed county and state minimums as appropriate to protect life and property. Uh, there are some alternatives included in 